Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, it's good to see everybody back again, and uh, I've explained this before, but i got to explain it every once in a while. They go for a coffee break between half hours, so I'm always glad to get them all back. All right, we're going to keep right on going. we got so much to cover, and... Uh, of course, it'd be great if the Lord came before we finished. I'd be ready. <clears throat> Wouldn't mind a bit. But we'll pick up where we just left off on uh, Paul's revelation now of what we call the dispensation of the grace of God. Tempting something totally different from what he was doing with Israel. And that is that he would offer salvation to the whole human race without a temple, without a set of rules and regulations, and a simple matter of believing the work of the cross as the basis of our salvation. And it's working. My Iris come back me up. The girls in the office hear it every day. How many people are finally seeing it for the first time? And uh, it just thrills us beyond your imagination. All right, so chapter 3 of Ephesians, we'll pick up where we left off, but we'll go back to verse 1. For this cause, because of the first two chapters, I, Paul, the prisoner, he is in prison in Rome, remember, and he's there because of the gospel of Jesus Christ that he's been taking out to the Gentiles. Now verse 2 again. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given... To me, to you word. Well, we covered that in the last half hour. That's obvious. We pick up all of these doctrines of Paul in his epistles and nowhere else. All right, and we're going to be looking at it. The uh, brother has been kind enough to put them on the board for me. And uh, we're going to look at now verse 3. How that by revelation to me the mystery. Now there the word is singular. So it envelops all the mysteries that become part of Pauline doctrine or are part of this dispensation of the grace of God. All right, we'll just run over them quickly. I don't want to have to stand in front of somebody that can't see it, so I'll try to get off to the side. But here we start with eight distinct mysteries that Paul reveals in various places throughout his letters, and we're going to look at them one by one, but let's just go over them quickly. Number one, right back there in Ephesians chapter one, we have the mystery of his will. In other words, the will of God concerning mankind. We're going to see the mystery of Christ in our next verse now in Ephesians three. We're going to see the mystery of the body of Christ in Colossians one. We're going to see the mystery of God in Colossians two. The mystery of godliness in 1 Timothy. The mystery of Israel's blinding, which we talked about in the first half hour this afternoon. It was a mystery, a secret. We're going to talk about the mystery of the rapture, and that's exactly what Paul calls it. In the very first verse that he begins in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51, he says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all die, but we all shall be changed. Well, it's a mystery. And then the final one, the eighth one, is the mystery of iniquity that he speaks of in 2 Thessalonians when he makes the only reference in all his epistles to Old Testament prophecy. And that concerns the mystery of iniquity. So we're going to be looking at all these mysteries, and you put them all together. If we were to put them in a circle, you could call that then singularly the mystery. How that all of this composite work of God poured out on this apostle and by whom we have received it becomes then our dispensational directions or instructions or however you want to call it. All right, so now then verse 4. Whereby, when you read, in other words, we read his letters, Romans through Philemon, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the what? The mystery of Christ. Now, I hope I can do this right. What word triggers knowledge? Now, that's ambiguous. I know it is. Wisdom. If you've got wisdom, you're going to practice what? 
knowledge. Now go with me to a verse that we look at so often, and I use it when people accuse me of making too much of the Apostle Paul. Keep your hand in Ephesians. Now remember what word I'm talking about. Wisdom and knowledge. How that it is all part of this revelation of these truths that were totally kept secret until it was given to this apostle. All right, 2 Peter chapter 3, and again verse 15 and 16. For probably the 300th time in our years on television. Account that the long-suffering patience of our Lord is salvation. My God's not willing that any should be lost. You know that. All right, 2 Peter 3, verse 15, now reading on. The long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even, now watch this carefully, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom and knowledge, see, given unto him, has written unto you. Well, where did he get it? From the ascended Lord. And who is recognizing the fact? Peter. See? Peter is telling his Jewish readers of that epistle, since Judaism is now going through the cracks, God knows, as he inspired Peter to write, the temple will be gone in just another two, three, four years. The priest will be gone. So what's left for the Jew? Paul's gospel. See? And so that's why he's telling them. In view of what's out in front now, it isn't going to be the tribulation and the second coming of the kingdom. Now it's going to be a period of time, the dispensation of the grace of God. And if you're going to cash in on that, Peter says, you go back to Paul, because that's the only place you'll find it. And when I talk to people on the phone, you know what I always ask them? Why didn't Peter say, go back to John's gospel? That's what most people tell you today. Well, if you're looking for salvation, go read John's gospel. Uh-uh. Peter didn't do it, and I won't either. I never tell anybody, go read John. I tell everybody, you go read Romans through Philemon, because that's where it's at. But see, I want you to see that that's what the Scripture says. That's just not my idea. Peter says, you go to Paul because of the wisdom that's been given unto him, and he has written it unto you. And then verse 16, in all his epistles, see, I think he's referring to Hebrews. A lot of people won't agree with that, and that's fine. I don't mind. But I think when he says up here that he has already written unto you, he was referring to the book of Hebrews because that's where Paul is appealing to the Jew who is contemplating his message, but they still got one foot over the fence in Judaism, see? And the word that Paul uses all through Hebrews is better. Yes, Judaism was good in its day and time, but this is so much better. Yes, the law was good, but grace is better. And all the way through the book of Hebrews, just look for it. You got that word, better, 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 see? All right, and so Peter is understanding that. And he says, yes, he said, you go to Paul, but not just Hebrews. Verse 16, all his epistles. See that? All his epistles. And he's speaking in them of these things pertaining to salvation, see? And in which that his epistles are some things hard to be understood. You've all heard this one before. And it's hard to comprehend. But I, I can get an idea of why Peter, because he was so steeped in legalism himself, and God didn't really expect him to embrace all this, I don't think. No, others will disagree, that's fine. But I think Peter was kept separate providentially. But then Peter includes all these other false teachers, see, that are unlearned and unstable. And what do they do with Paul's epistles? They twist them all out of shape so that they lose all their meaning. And they do it with the other scriptures. And what's their end result? Their destruction. Now that's tough language, see? Okay, back to Ephesians. So we continue on now with what Paul calls the dispensation of the grace of God, which is really the revelation of all these mysteries. And when you put them in a composite, it's the mystery. 
Something that has never been revealed. Now again, just look at them. Just, just look at them. They're all from Paul's epistles, and not one of those premises can you find anywhere else in Scripture. Nowhere. Try it, and you won't find it. And that's why it's called a mystery. It was kept secret since the age began. In fact, if I remember right, the last moment of our last taping, come back with me, I'm pretty sure we were in Romans chapter 16. Jerry, maybe you remember, was it? Yeah. Romans 16. Let's go back there a minute. Now, I've got to keep hammering away and hammering away and hammering away because little by little you're going to see it. Some of you may see it a lot faster than others. But I've got to remember I've got that TV audience out there, and fortunately I forget about them. You know that. You know that when I'm teaching you people, I forget all about those cameras. They, they never enter my mind. See, that's why I say things sometimes that I wish I wouldn't say. <laughs> But it's fortunate, because I think if I was totally aware of those cameras, I wouldn't teach as easily as I do. But I can. I can forget all about them. All right, Romans 16, verse 25. Now to him. Now remember, this is all Holy Spirit inspired. Paul didn't sit there in some conclave all by himself debating, how can I put this? How can I? What word should I use? No, it just flowed like a river, see? And he says, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel. And what's Paul's gospel? The death, burial, and resurrection. And the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the what? The mystery. See, Paul's gospel is going to fit hand in glove with every one of these. All except the very last one, the mystery of iniquity, which of course is the other side of the coin, see? But all of this is part of Paul's revelations. All right? According to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept, what? Secret, how long? Since the ages began. Where's that begin? Adam? See? It's never been revealed before. Oh, maybe in a latent form, yes. All the groundwork was being laid all the way up through the Old Testament for the work of the cross. But to reveal it to mankind as a means of justification and redemption and forgiveness and all these good things, no, it's not back there. The only place you'll find it are in Paul's epistles. All right, so now come back with me to Ephesians chapter 3 again. So this mystery, Paul's knowledge of the mystery of Christ, which, like he says here in verse 5, just like in Romans 16, which in other ages or dispensations or periods of time, however you want to put it, was not made known to the sons of men, but it's now revealed under his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Now be careful. It wasn't revealed to the twelve, so he's not talking about the prophets and the apostles of Israel. He's talking about the men who became apostles with him. Barnabas, and Silas, Timothy, Titus, and some of these other men who had gifted ability to proclaim word. Because now you've got to remember, how many years has this gospel of grace been going to the Gentile world without benefit of one page of Paul's epistles? How long? Well, about 15 years. See, he began his ministry about 40, and i got to look a minute. I don't think he wrote Thessalonians until... I have to look in my Bible. i got it here someplace. About 54. That's 14 years. 14 years, these early little congregations had no benefit of anything written. So what did they depend on? Gifted men. See? And that was the gift of prophecy. Now, let me show you that. 1 Corinthians. Chapter 14. Yeah, 1 Corinthians, chapter 14. Verse 1. Verse 1. 
Got it? Paul is writing to the Corinthian church, and he says, follow after love or charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather are the most important that you can what? Prophesy. Now, the word prophesy here in the Greek does not mean tell the future like Isaiah did, but it meant to speak forth. Well, if it hadn't been for gifted men, Christianity would have died almost immediately because Paul couldn't do it all alone. After he established a little congregation of believers up there, somebody had to carry it on. Well, who did it? Gifted men. Now, once the scriptures became a completed thing, and Paul's epistles are now available for all the little, that gift died away. It was no longer necessary to that extent. So always understand, and that's why I love history. I mean, you've got to understand how these things came about before it makes sense. All right, so now then back to Ephesians chapter 3 again. That it was revealed to not only Paul, but his fellow apostles and prophets by, again, the Holy Spirit. Now verse 6, that the Gentiles, see, a total different approach than when he was dealing with Israel, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs. Wow. You see that? Was Israel ever promised anything like that? No. Back up with me. Romans. I don't know how many of you folks in here watch the daily program, but I think we've been in Romans lately. Romans chapter 8. Because see, too many times we read these words and it doesn't mean anything. But Gentiles coming in as a fellow heir with the God of Israel? Unbelievable. But that's where they are, and that's where we are. All right, Romans 8. Starting up there at verse 14. See, and this is what made the Jews so envious. And of course, that's what God intended it to do. He said in Romans 11 that he might make them jealous. That here we were as Gentiles reaping blessings that they could have had, but they rejected, see? All right, Romans 8, starting in verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, they are the sons, or I think a better word is children, of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage, that's a small s, so it's that spirit of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, of adoption or of placing us now like the father with a business would bring his 14-year-old son. You remember I've explained that over and over. That's adoption, is to be brought in beside the father with full responsibility. And the Middle East is good at that. They know how to train those kids. I've given the illustration more than once of how Iris found that out firsthand. That she could deal with this little 14-year-old and the old man was sitting over there in the corner just letting him have at it. And I asked him, I said, you can let that kid do that? And he says, he's never lost a dime yet. Why? Because he had him well tutored before he came into that position. Well, that's where we are in the body of Christ, see? It's not heaven or hell. It's a position. All right, read on. You've not received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Respect to our position. Now then, verse 16, the Spirit himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Not gods, but we are children of God. Now then, verse 17, here it comes. Now if we're children, then what? We're heirs, heirs of God, joint heir with Christ. I don't, very, I don't think many people believe that. I just don't think that most Christians believe that. A joint heir with Jesus Christ, the creator of the universe. Well, what's a joint heir? Come on, tell me, what's a joint heir? Yeah, what's his is mine, what's mine is his. That's it. What a position. No wonder the Jews were jealous. All they're going to get is an earthly kingdom. We're going to be joint heirs with Christ himself. Not gods. Don't ever get that idea. We never become gods. 
But my goodness, we become joint heirs with Christ. All right, read on. Joint heirs with Christ, if so be we suffer with him, we may also be glorified together by virtue of that position. And we gain that position not with works, but by our faith in that finished work of the cross. My, I don't see how you can get it any better than that. All right, come back to Ephesians chapter 3. Our time is going fast again. Verse 6, just to read into verse 7. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body, of which, remember, Christ is the head and we're the body, and partakers of his promise in Christ, like I just said, not by works what we do, but by what? Faith in the gospel. See? Now verse 7. Whereof? This gospel and what it can do for lost humanity. Paul said, I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Now, to show you the impact of that word minister, come back again to Romans chapter 15. So that you see what an important what an important word it really is when Paul says that I am a minister of this gospel of the grace of God. In Romans 15, verse 8, verse that I several months back used every time I had a class. Haven't used it now lately. Romans 15, <laughs> verse 8. All got it? Now I say that Jesus Christ was a what? Minister. See? Same word. That Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision, the nation of Israel, for the truth of God. But as the minister to Israel, what was his role? To fulfill the promises made to the fathers. In other words, all the covenant promises were his to fulfill. But Israel didn't buy it. All right, now the Apostle Paul has that same kind of authority, not like Christ over Israel, but he is still given that place of preeminence as the Apostle of the Gentiles by virtue of being the minister of this age of grace. All right? Where was I now? Verse 8. Unto me, unto this one man, Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, unmerited favor. He didn't deserve it. He didn't work for it. He didn't go to school for eight years so he could get a sheepskin that would now make him uh, available. Uh-uh. No, it was all by God's grace that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. What does that mean? My, what this man has been permitted to feed to us are beyond human understanding. We just take what little we grasp by faith, but it's so unsearchable, beloved, we'll never understand it until we get there. In fact, that's getting to be one of my favorite answers anymore. You know, they call me with these questions, and for a lot of people, it's a point of controversy. And you know what I say? Listen, if it doesn't affect our eternal destiny, if it doesn't affect our Christian walk, then forget it. We'll find out when we get there. I think that's a good answer. A lot of these things we can't answer. Why argue about them? They're not going to affect your eternal destiny. They have nothing to do with the plan of salvation. If it doesn't tell you to go out and live like the world or something like that, if it still maintains our Christian walk, Hey, what difference does it make? Now, I can give you one example. Genesis chapter 6 is a big chapter of controversy where it says that there were giants in the earth in those days. Now, you know, there are two lines of theological thought. And I've got a chart at home. Great men, famous men on each side of the coin. Over here are men who say that these were fallen angels who had actually had relationship with female women and they had giant children. 
Over on the other side are those that teach like I always have, and I'm beginning to rethink it, maybe I'm wrong, that it was a breakdown between the godly line of Seth and the ungodly line of Cain. That's always been my take. But listen, what difference does it make? If I win the argument, so what? It's not going to make any difference. So a lot of these things now, that's the way I'm starting to answer people. I say, look, if it doesn't affect your salvation, if it doesn't affect your Christian testimony, hey, we'll find out when we get there. Then we'll get full knowledge, and uh, if the Lord wants us to know, we'll know. I think it's a good way to look at a lot of these things. All right, let's go on a little bit yet in Ephesians, and then the half hour is gone again. Now verse 9. After contemplating the unsearchable riches of Christ, unfathomable, will never plumb the depths, will never reach the height of them. But now, verse 9, this was Paul's goal as a human being, as an instrument in God's hands, to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. What do these seven premises do for you and I as believers in our fellowship with one another. Why, it just brings us together like family, see? We are one in Christ, all right? The fellowship of the mystery, and again, where did it come from? Which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God. Now listen, that's not there just to fill the page. That's what it means. These truths were hid in the mind of God. Now, you know, I always go back to Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those that are revealed belong to us and our children. All right, that's the concept all through Scripture. God can keep things secret as long as he wants to, and he'll reveal it in his own good time. All right, so all the rest of Scripture never makes one mention of these mysteries, not one, except the iniquity. And so they are Pauline revelations, and you and I can just embrace them, and if you're the only one in the whole family that believes it, hey, blessed, you are the blessed one. Because you see, most of Christendom does not buy it. They just cannot believe it. Watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1 800 369 7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.